Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all. We're a nation of immigrants, a country with roots in other soils. Nowhere is that more true than in the country of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Falls, inviting you to tune in to A Taste of Louisiana and a new series dedicated to our food heritage. Louisianians are descendants of seven primary nations that have influenced every dish we cook today. Welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. I got a robe up in that kingdom made of that good news. I got a robe up in that kingdom made of that good news. All right. How you doing, Chef? Good to see you. You sound wonderful. <laughs> How y'all doing? Hey, nice to see you, man. Nice to see you. How you doing, guy? Hey, there you go. Hey, thanks for bringing all the guys with you. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. Thank you. Y'all, I tell you, Judy Whitney Davis over here on music. Thank you so much for that beautiful. <laughs> What a, uh, what a fabulous audience. Uh, thank you all so much for being here as we continue to explore the great culture and cuisine of this fabulous state we call the Bayou State, or Louisiana. And, and today we're cooking the foods of one of my all-time favorite contributors to the culture and cuisine of Louisiana, the Africans. They came here in slavery, they came against their will, but Louisiana would never be the state it is without the contribution of these fabulous Americans. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the Africans, and y'all, you know what I'm cooking for you. I'm cooking some great dishes. Uh, Joe, I'm gonna cook a seven steak for you in a little bit. So you just sit patiently right there, okay? <laughs> y'all, yams, uh, red beans, rice, melons, okra, eggplant. Well, that might sound like a grocery list for a good Sunday dinner in the South, but these are foods indigenous to West Africa, the homeland of most of Louisiana's African Americans. Dr. Gwendolyn Midlow Hall and Professor Eileen Julian spoke with me about the roots of much of Louisiana's African cuisine. The reproachable act of human bondage has stained mankind's history through the ages. While the imprisoned suffered hardships, it's true, Louisiana's history would be incomplete without the Africans' culinary and cultural legacy to this state. Senegambia, the region of West Africa located between the Senegal and Gambia rivers, was home to two-thirds of the slaves brought to Louisiana. During the 1720s, the Company of the Indies focused their efforts on this area where they had exclusive trading rights. Gore, the best port in the Senegal concession, served as the main warehouse of slaves. Many of the slaves from Senegal were brought over specifically for their agricultural skills, their skills in cultivating rice, indigo, but also just about every other crop grown in Louisiana, including corn, which they had raised for hundreds of years. But aside from the agricultural skills, they were brought because of mechanical skills. They, had, they were not just blacksmiths, but they were machinists. The first slave ship from Senegal, Le Ruby, arrived in Louisiana in July 1720, though a few Africans had lived in the colony since 1709. Between 1720 and 1723, more than 500 slaves came from Senegambia. In 1721, nearly 300 arrived from the Congo and Angola. The last Senegambian slave ship arrived in 1743. They came from Senegambia, which is the far northwest corner of Africa, I've estimated that about a thir about 15 percent of them were of the Bamana nation. 
The Wolof were very important people who lived along the coast and they had a high proportion of women among them, whereas the Bamanahet were almost entirely men. There were some Fulbe who also came from, from Senegal. In Louisiana, slaves were highly regarded for their cooking abilities. A good cook gardened, pickled, brewed, baked, and even washed, ironed, and sewed. A great variety of tasty delicacies were served daily on the master's table. Being an excellent cook was an asset for an owner, especially if the slave was later sold at auction. Good food was so important to the French settlers that many male slaves were even sent to Paris for culinary training. Cooking was a very important skill and cooks and pastry chefs fetched very high prices in Louisiana, in colonial Louisiana. Occasionally, there was fresh beef or pork. Of course, slaves always received the less desirable cuts of meat. Seasonally, there were turnips, sweet potatoes, or perhaps cabbages, field peas, and rice. Vegetables were cooked in the coals while fresh meat was roasted on a makeshift spit. With only one cooking utensil per household, most slaves either boiled or fried their food. The slaves grew, largely grew their own food, and they cultivated rice and poultry and pigs and cattle, and they took care of doing their own butchering and, and salting and preserving. They sold the goods they cultivated in the market place, mainly in New Orleans, but in some other more rural areas as well. Slaves also made pralines, pies, and Calais or rice cakes to sell outside of churches, including St. Louis Cathedral after mass. Many slave men caught and sold oysters on a half shell to strollers on the levee. The Africans were ingenious cooks. They fed themselves and they fed their master's household. But more importantly, they fed the economy of Louisiana for generations with their free labor and back-breaking work. Today, it's right and just to pay homage to those who contributed so much to the culture and cuisine of this nation. There's, a, there's no other way there's absolutely no other way to say it. It's right and just to pay homage to a culture that built this state's culinary traditions and certainly so much of what we're proud of in this state. And when I think of trying to cook in this state and not think of the contributions of Africa for its ingredients and African cooks in the kitchen, in the kitchen of homes, the kitchen of hotels, the kitchen of restaurants, the great cooks we all learn from, I can't think of a dish that we could do without the help of the Africans. So a personal standing ovation from me to the uh, African culture of Louisiana. And uh, there's a very important uh, saying that I think about all the time when we try to reference the contributions of the Africans or the plight of the slave. And I think about this saying because it's just so important. It says, until the lion writes its own story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And I think it's a very important piece when we talk about uh, the, the African. So uh, a couple of guests in the kitchen to help me through uh, the cooking and of course the history. And I, I tell you, how could I cook anything from the cuisine of the, uh, the Creoles, the Africans of Louisiana without the queen of Creole cooking, Leah Chase from the world famous Dookie Chase's restaurant in New Orleans. <laughs> And the guy who's gonna keep me straight on my facts today, Michael Fervin, and my, Michael's a history professor at Southern University, the, the largest uh, African-American university uh, system. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. That's a very important uh, school in America. Michael, nice to have you here with us. Glad yeah, to be here, thank you. <laughs> And then, of course, nice, nice to him, one of the best cooks. Well, one of the best cooks. We're gonna, you're going to meet her in a little while on, 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 on uh, uh, tape here. Pearly Jefferson of the old coffee pot in New Orleans. She taught me how to make Cali cakes, y'all. Pearly, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and and Don, uh, Don Mastroni, the executive chef there. Don sitting at the end of the counter. Don, nice to have you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
and then a, a, another another of Louisiana's great artists, Eddie Marmon, is sitting right in the front row. And y'all, if you see that gorgeous painting right on the wall uh, behind me here, Eddie was here a couple of days ago and actually did the sketch and painted that while uh, on the set. And uh, Eddie Marmon, nice to have you here. Thank you so much. Y'all, let's, uh, let's take a look at the ingredients that we normally think about when we think about African foods in Louisiana. The contributions are too numerous to mention in a basket. But of course, okra, and in the, in the, uh, the language of the Senegalese and the uh, Congolese, uh, guimi gambo or ken gambo, the okra plant, which of course gave name to our premier or premium soup in Louisiana, gumbo. The yams, a lot of dispute over whether it was the white yams, the tuba, the, the, the red yams. The yams, a gift from the Africans. And here's another uh, tuber that has a long root on it. I'm gonna see how long this root is gonna get. Another African tuber that came here to the New World. Tomatoes. Africans cooked a tremendous amount with tomatoes, black-eyed peas on every uh, New Year's Day table, the sesame seeds, watermelons, rice, rice. Many of the African slaves were brought here because of their knowledge of grain growing. And peppers, they love peppers more than any uh, Cajun cook ever will. They really love the peppers of, uh, of Senegal in that area. So what am I gonna cook for you today? I'm gonna take one uh, of the things out in Lee. I think you and I agree that this is one of the great dishes. Smothered okra and tomatoes, right? Yeah, that's great. Oh, really good. And y'all, I'm gonna begin with a little bacon fat. Oh yeah. You want, <laughs> oh yeah, a little smoky bacon fat. Leah, this is like a cooking gumbo zyabar or, or oh, that nice great. nice green stuff. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, cook this up. My cast iron pot is really uh, uh, cooking nicely here. And of course, what would you put into it? Well, an African slave would have probably used a little bacon fat, would have just used the okra and the tomatoes out of the garden. But of course, as time moved on, uh, some of the other vegetables, because they did grow their own gardens for their own sustenance. So uh, onions, celery, bell pepper, things like that would certainly have gone into the pot and naturally garlic because garlic and tomatoes, very big in African uh, cooking. And uh, Michael, it's been said that, uh, that the African could go down into the market after a while, after they grew their own goods, got down to the market in New Orleans and sell some of these goods for, uh, for extra dollars. Now, you always think of slaves being kept on the plantation or whatever. Is this folklore or did they actually have an opportunity they to sell They did. Things? Louisiana is unique in that regard that African slaves who were enslaved, especially in the New Orleans area, were given opportunities to have what they call truck gardens right. on the side of the plantations that they can grow their own crops and then go on to the French quarters and sell those crops for right. their own profit. And then make a, make a couple extra dollars as well. And of course the Calais cakes, which we're gonna cook in just a minute, was also a product of the African slave cooking rice and going into the market. So y'all, we have our onion, celery, bell pepper, garlic, enough garlic, everything's okay here, Leah, I'm, I'm looking at you. It's looking good. Uh, looking, looking good, good. Look, if I get a blessing from good. Leah, I got a blessing. Looking huh? good. Okay, y'all, not okra. A lot of people like to cook it about, uh, cut it about the size of a nickel. I like to cut mine about the size of two nickels. Now, of course, some people will put this in the microwave, cover it with clear wrap and just kind of microwave it for about 15 or 20 minutes to start the cooking process because this is going to take a while. Get back in my pot here. Uh, uh, this is going to start the cooking process. The okra has to cook down and you know some people say it gets a little slimy in here. Well that's the protein being extruded from the plant and the way to get rid of it is by adding an acid like a tomato. So you put your tomato in here. Uh, Leah, I'm gonna put me a little smoked sausage. Mm. You don't mind, baby? No, that's the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you can have some smoked sausage. This is gonna cook now, y'all, for about 35, 40 minutes. You could eat it as a side dish, or you could put it in gumbos and stews. Uh, I'll tell you what, I've even seen chicken breast stuffed with a smothered okra. And look what it looks like when it's all said and done here. It cooks down like this. Whew, Lee, I'm gonna let you taste this, baby. Look how they see how the okra's cooked nice and smooth there. You keep your eye on that for me, Leah. Y'all, uh, New Orleanians often attended Sunday morning mass and they were famished when they emerged from the church because of course they had to take communion and they couldn't eat after midnight. Well, lucky for them, many African Americans made little money by selling pralines and other goodies on the steps of the cathedral. And an absolute favorite snack were the little rice or Calais cakes. Chef Don Mastroni and Pearlie Jefferson of the old coffee pot in New Orleans just taught me how to make a nice hot bunch and eat it. 
Y'all, when one looks for the famous Cali cakes of New Orleans, there's only one place to go, and that's the old coffee pot on St. Peter Street right here in the French Quarter of New Orleans. And I'm here with the chef, Chef Don Mastroni. And Don, thanks so much for giving me a little lesson on the sure. Calais cake. Nice to be here. So you're beginning uh, uh, with a little bit rice. The rice is cooked, right? It's the rice on... is cooked soft. Yeah, is it cooked with any seasoning, sugar? Nope, it's just plain rice. We want to get the flavor of the rice, the right. natural starch in the rice. Right. And it's cooked just to its soft, right. and then we stop it. And, and you dump it into uh, th uh, into eggs, We've which got already three beaten eggs right. in here. Well, go ahead and dump it We're in there. Now. Dump that rice in there. Now this is an old dish that came to Louisiana from from Africa, That's and right. of course Africans yes. brought rice with them. And uh, and the the, the the history is, I guess, that on Sunday morning the African women with the big baskets on their head would walk around the quarter after church and sell their uh, Belle Calais, their Calais cakes, right? That is correct. That's yeah. in 1800s that started here in the corner. Uh, so now a little vanilla into it. So it's actually like a rice pudding almost. Very actually. much so. Yeah. Very much so. And so, then we're going to put a little cinnamon in it. Okay, good. Good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. So I got that for you. And no problem. And uh, a little nutmeg. I yeah. got to have that nutmeg. So all, all of those good aromatic uh, spices. All and those then, Caribbean spices. Yep. Too. And then you have a little sugar. Sugar. That goes in there. Oh, my God. So this Thank looks really chef. fantastic. All right. And, and then, then, no, then yep. we're going to go with a little flour. Oh, this is okay. actually what we use as a pancake mix. In the old uh -huh. days, they used the flour. And they added yeast to it to bring the rise up. But right. now we use a pancake flour, a little oh, modern yeah, day no, thing. Sure, no, but it's got a nice, keeps it nice and fluffy. And fluffy. Too. Um, and that's about a cup and a half to a cup and a quarter. And well, we're going to. Well, you just go ahead and keep on mixing them because uh, uh, then that, that's basically everything that goes into it. That so simple. once the batter is mixed, it's going to go into what, about a 350 degree oil? 350 Now, oil. I know we have some already uh, done, and I think uh, Pearl is going to bring those in uh, those in for us. These just cook till they float, right? That is correct. All yeah. right. Look, hey, here's the lady of the moment here with the wonderful... Uh, Kelly rice cakes not 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 probably you've been here at the old coffee pot for how many years 45 years <laughs> <laughs> 45 years so you so I would say that you've served a few of these in your lifetime huh many 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 now let me ask you how do people do people come into New Orleans knowing what the Kelly rice cakes are or do they come here trying to find a new experience and are shocked when they see this some come knowing and some come shop, wanting to know what it is. Yeah. Some wants to know whether it's like a rice cake you buy in the grocery store. And I always <laughs> oh, no. say, no, 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 you will love these. Now, <laughs> now, now they leave the city of New Orleans wanting to come back to get yes. more, right? Yes. Now these are uh, uh, an old tradition here. Is there many places in New Orleans that sell them? This is the only place that I know of that has the rice cake. So yeah. everyone that's watching come to have rice cake. <laughs> yeah, you're a good salesman, girl. You're a good, 45 years. Now look, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but I know that you actually worked, uh, uh, I know Leah Chase worked here, the great Creole chef in New Orleans, worked at the old coffee pot many, many years ago. And uh, uh, and you know what, I think that Leah Chase probably had a few of these herself, but uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to let him fry, Kelly. I'm going to let you continue to serve them. I'm going to eat them. Put me a little bit of that syrup on top of them because they serve with syrup, right? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Y'all, I tell you what, I just wish you were here at the old coffee pot. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, delicious. Bell, bell Cali to shoe. Huh? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Oh boy, I tell you, hot Cali cakes, a little powdered sugar on top of it, right pearly, just a little powdered sugar, Don, huh? a little bit of uh, cane syrup on top of it, huh? just whoo, a lot, I like a lot of cane syrup on mine. Now, now Pearly, don't you judge me too harshly. Huh? You grab one of those, babe, right there. Don, you grab one of those. All right. Michael, you can have one of those too. All right, thank you. Huh? I see you went for that big one. Uh, <laughs> Y'all, one of the great, and this is just another one of the dishes of the street vendors in uh, New Orleans. 300 years later, they're still on our table and we're paying homage to them. So uh, what's the uh, 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 the next dish I want to do? I want to put something cooking right away here so we can talk, because I want to talk a little bit about those spirituals as well. Uh, 
simple meats. Remember the, the Africans were taking pieces of something off of the table out of the big house that wasn't available to them until they started raising some of their own chickens and all of that. But one of the dishes that would have been uh, found on most early tables would have been the shoulder steaks or the seven roll steaks. We call them seven steaks. And I remember our old butcher, his name was Chewing Gum. <laughs> Chewing Gum would come down the, 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 the street and uh, he would have these beautiful seven steaks with the seven bone in it. Uh, and some of them would be cut really, really thin. So he would uh, give them to you as lanyap, you know, a little extra. Something a little extra would be lanyap. And we'd put it between two slices of bread. Oh my, I tell you, fry them up in a little fat. And that was, that was one of the best breakfasts you could have. Seven steak sandwich. Eat around the bone. A little bit more bacon fat. You don't mind, Aaliyah? Love it. <laughs> the bacon fat is going to give you the smoke. And of course, they would have never uh, gotten rid of that. Now, I'm going to get this uh, nice and high. I'm going to season the seven steaks with a little bit. You want to season them nicely because remember, not a whole lot of seasoning other than this. We add onion, celery, bell pepper to everything we cook. Now, but in those days, this could be sold. So not all the time would you find it going on to a, into a black iron skillet. Uh, no flour. Again, remember, flour is a, a, a commodity then back there that's very hard to get. So you're not going to flour this. Now, while this is cooking, I'm going to put two of them in here to fry nicely. I'm going to season the top of them again here. And of course, African, I'm going to put a little cayenne pepper. And uh, Judy, I, I, I noticed that you sang a beautiful, uh, well, was it gospel or was it spiritual? What's the difference? Actually, now this is going to come up for some argument. Spirituals. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> spirituals, what we now know as spirituals, originally were called corn ditties. And over time, they began to get the term of field songs because they would sing at a certain speed and cadence to get the crops done or to get the cotton going. However, when you talk about gospel, you're talking about Thomas Dorsey, and that's not the horn player. Right. He was actually a black artist who was what you call the father of gospel. Sadly, the church that he was in for years burned down about two or three months ago in, Chicago, in the Chicago area. But they started to use certain chord progressions that were more common with blues and jazz. Uh, whatever you want to call it, absolutely fabulous music. And you're going to stop in your tracks when you hear it. You always do. And uh, Michael, a, a question for you. Governor Pinchback was the first African-American governor of the state of Louisiana. Now, he found, did he found uh, uh, or wrote the bill to found he Southern University? He introduced the bill in the legislature to have right. the university established. Originally in New Orleans, right. late 1880s, and then eventually moving to the Baton Rouge area where it is now. Now, you know, I mentioned that Southern University was the largest African-American university in the country, but is that correct? or? Uh, to say it properly, is the largest hi historically black college and university system. Right, uh, okay. Meaning there's a multitude of different campuses, the Shreveport campus, the New Orleans campus. We have the, the flagship in Baton Rouge along with the law center right. and the nursing school. Gee, what a great university. How many students now? Uh, well, since the storm, that number is fluctuating, yeah, oh but yeah. uh, our total student body is usually around 12,000. Yeah. Anyway, y'all, look at my round steak coming together real nicely here. Now, how do I flavor them? I'm going to put in my onion, celery, bell pepper, and as I'm putting this in, uh, Don, you're a guy from Maryland. Uh, you come to uh, the old coffee pot after the storm. You come to help out in Louisiana. And you end up at one of the most famous restaurants making one of the most famous dishes. How easy a transition was that, making those Calais cakes? It was a natural transition. I enjoyed the process and learning about it. I had done some studying on that type of food and, and African-American food as well as traditional Creole and Cajun food, right. so it was really fun. Right, really, and then you had one of the best teachers, uh, and, and, and when I go into the old coffee pot in Pearly, I tell you, you all keep everybody laughing, and, <laughs> and I tell you, the food you all do at the old coffee pot, fantastic, I love your breakfasts as well. Y'all, you just continue to cook this until it's brown on all sides. I'm gonna add a little bit beef stock in here. You can put a lid on it and go into the oven at 350 degrees for about an hour and a half. You can cook it on top of the stove, pot roasted here. And this is how I would serve it. The very tender uh, uh, meat. Of course, I'd make a sandwich like I did with chewing gum. You know, oh yeah, Lee, I know what you, and this is called a fold over, y'all. You know what a fold over is? Hey, that's, uh, that's the way us poor people eat. Y'all enjoy that and thank y'all so much right there.
<laughs> Y'all, I tell you what, time flies when you're enjoying good food, fold overs, great conversation with friends in the kitchen. Thanks for stopping by as we continue to explore our unique food heritage and cook hush, up another great taste of Louisiana. Somebody calling my name. To purchase the Encyclopedia of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Bowles, featuring more than 750 traditional recipes, a CD-ROM of the book, or a copy of the program featuring all three episodes of Today's Culture, call the number on your screen. Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all.